Anthony, when you hear physics of the observer, there seems to be a dramatic mismatch in terms of scale. An observer is, uh, take us, we're six feet, five, six feet. And we're talking about mm -hmm. physics, we're talking about 10 to the minus 20 <laughs> degree, uh, orders of magnitude. So why is an observer even relevant to what's happening at such a micro level? Well, you have to remember how physics started out. You know, it didn't always start out with subatomic particles. There were planets in the uh -huh. beginning. So, you know, when Newton first formulated his laws and uh, gravity, the universal law of gravitation, those were all astronomical objects. And part of what was so great about it was, in some sense, you didn't have to think about observers. This was objective reality. Mm -hmm. This was the, the right, universe right. out there. And we were describing it, and, and we were sort of in the background. And that became kind of the, the whole project of physics. There's an objective world, it's independent of us, we describe it using these mathematical laws, and we had this great success in doing that. And we get power and, and explanatory power and technological power out of that. But a really interesting thing happened, of course, in the beginning of the 20th century, when, when all of this basically fell apart with the advent of quantum mechanics. And, you know, physicists resisted it, they, they saw that as they tried to formulate the laws of the very small, they found that, you know, whatever you do, your act as an observer, the fact that you're observing something, just inevitably affects it. And this seemed at first like, well, that's just an annoying thing. Like, you know, if we, if I shine light on something, yeah, I, I might warm it up a little yeah. bit, or I might push it a tiny bit from the radiation pressure, you know, just a, an artifact of con inconvenience that we affect things. But, but the more people kind of studied it and they, as they formulated laws of quantum mechanics, they found that this was not just a sort of an artifact irritating of the artifact. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a part of nature that not only could you inconveniently uh, affect things, you inevitably affected things. And so starting then with, with sort of the creation of quantum mechanics, it, the observers become sort of more and more wrapped up in physics. You can't describe quantum mechanics without talking about the observer. Although you know, physicists try and try to banish the observer because they, you know, they want to get back to that dream of the objective world. But the observer just kind of keeps coming back, even in the smallest things. Okay. Now, when we say observer, um, what is what does that mean? It means mm -hmm. uh, 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 a accessing information from the system, which is not through our eyes as an observer that we think it's through instrumentation or so how do you distinguish between the uh, observer being a, a sentient being mm -hmm. and a measurement device it, it's an interesting question because you know obviously when we're talking about you know i'm looking at a tree I'm the observer that's looking at the tree, but when we're talking about a subatomic particle, well, I'm looking at a lot of those, but, yeah. <laughs> but not in a particularly useful way in terms of physics. So, so we have these complicated machines, and the machines interact with the subatomic particle and, you know, and, and take that tiny thing and sort of amplify the information in it up to a scale that is useful and, and sort of on a macroscopic level mm -hmm. where I can, I can look at the readout on the machine. But there's a, a kind of fundamental question in quantum mechanics, where does the observation actually take place? And, and, and there's this curious argument because, you know, suppose I have this tiny little subatomic particle, right? I can't do anything with it because I'm a big macroscopic yeah. person. So I get a machine, you know, that carefully hooks up to this subatomic particle and makes measurements. Maybe it measures the spin of the particle and whether it's this way or that way. So the machine, it's a tiny little machine, you know, small enough that it can act, yeah. interact with the particle. So it does that. Now that little machine though is pretty small. Maybe I can use quantum mechanics to describe that machine. Okay, so I describe that machine and now that's part of the quantum system. So originally I had this quantum system that was a particle. I tried to measure it, but I got a machine that's now I can think of as a quantum system. So now I have to observe that. So let me get a bigger machine and I'll <laughs> observe the, the little machine with the bigger one. Okay, I can do that, but why can't I use quantum mechanics to describe that bigger thing? In other words, is there, a, is there a limit to the things that I can use quantum mechanics on? You know, I have to use it for really small things, but I can use it for bigger things. And so if I go down that road, you know, this is a quantum system. It gets measured by this bigger thing, but I can think of that as a quantum system. I can think of the bigger thing as a quantum system. And now I'm reading, you know, a little dial out. I'm observing the quantum system. So now are you part of it too? Am I part of it too? Am I part of the quantum system? Or does the buck stop with me? You know, where I'm 
ultimately the observer has to be something like me that thinks that that imagines and so on and i think we don't really know you know where what what is enough to to make the observation happen uh, we know you know i feel like i've made an observation done uh, but you know to somebody over there maybe i'm part of a quantum system and they've still got to observe me well, if, uh, if a sentient creature is part of a quantum system, I mean, in the history of the universe, sentient creatures, as far as we know, have only come into being in the last uh, few billion years, even if you take it in the most extreme case, being uh -huh. any single cell, you know, plant or animal, sentient or not. Right. Um, so what happened before? I mean, quantum systems were working in the sure, universe sure. Be before yeah. there were observers of, of, of in, the, in the normal use of the term? It's a fascinating question. So I think I would say that we know that, well, we feel pretty strongly that I'm sufficient to be an observer. Right. You know, at least I right. believe that. Right. But uh, it, maybe I'm not necessary. Maybe I can call that first little machine that measured it. Maybe I can call, you know, a, a laboratory that nobody's in but still is taking readings in the middle of the night, you know, Certainly, that's big enough that it's not a quantum thing. So it's not doesn't feel quite right to quantum, call it a quantum thing, uh, though I can. You know, so, so it's this really weird paradox where uh, we're in the situation where big things, you know, we big things act as observers of small things, and yet big things also do seem to be subject to quantum mechanics, and and there are fascinating experiments that are going on pushing that boundary. Right, where, where you might say, well, it's just an atom that's quantum mechanical. But then they show that you can get a little cantilever, you know, that, that might be microns in size, yeah, which is huge, huge compared to an atom, right. um, that's also in a quantum superposition. That's yeah, amazing. So it seems that, that however big we try to push systems, quantum mechanics still seems to apply. But then why does it not apply to me and you? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Where, you know, I don't I, see I don't a superposition of you at this point. You certainly don't. <laughs> and, well, there, there is, a, I think... We do understand why I can't see a Robert here and a Robert there, in the sense that uh, that requires. So if we imagine, you know, the rules of quantum mechanics, we might decide let's flip this coin, you know, this quantum mechanical coin, and depending on whether it's heads or tails, you'll stay sitting or yeah. you'll get up. Um, so then the the sort of wave function, the quantum mechanical thing that describes us, would have a copy of Robert there and a copy of Robert there, but there's no way that either of those copies as described by quantum mechanics have a me observing both of those. So there's a copy of me observing this and a copy of me observing that, but there's no, there's nowhere in that sort of whole description of me mm -hmm. describing both. both. So I think, you know, that's an ax a, a part that I think we do understand. We sort of have mathematics to describe why don't we get, you know, observations of macroscopic superpositions. What we don't have is an explanation for why one of those happens and the other one doesn't, uh, or do they both happen, or do neither of them happen? Uh, that way, I think we don't have. And the question about what was going on before there were any measurements uh, through sentient creatures? Yeah, I think um, we have. We sort of have to believe. I, I think it's it's hard to give up that view of objective reality that there was stuff happening before there were observers, um, before there were sentient observers. But I think, you know, it, it, it's quite subtle, actually, because when you think of, when you think of atoms and planets and stuff, they seem very big and solid Robust. and, <laughs> and like it can't depend on us yeah. at all. But at some level, you think about, well, what is a, what is a planet exactly? You know, we've given the name planet to it. Uh, did planets really exist before there were anybody here to call them planets? We might say there was a there was a big collection of atoms that were together, but do, does collection, does together, do those things really make sense without <laughs> you know people to define them? Um, so, you know, if you think about the the early universe as a sort of a bunch of atoms, and imagine uh, just being presented with like a list of atoms. You know, here's a here's a big list of yeah. atoms. What's there? It's hard to say that there's any you know. It's hard to say what's there without us sort of conscious beings putting it together, making sense of it, giving definition to these things.